If you go to Nantucket Island, okay, so way over here on the, just about the furthest east part of the United States, there's this island called Nantucket Island, and there's a museum there, and this museum uh, is dedicated to a group of people called the Humane Society. And these were volunteers who would go out onto the beach, the east side of this island, and they would build these little huts, volunt- totally volunteers. They would build these little huts and they would scan the horizon and look for ships that were coming in, but that were going down, that had been shipwrecked. And these volunteers would risk their lives and go out into the waves, out into the dangerous ocean and rescue people. Why? Because they believed in the importance of human life, the humane society. And now this is done by the Coast Guard, And these group of people still meet today, though they don't go out on missions. And they have this famous phrase that they would say. They would say this, you have to go out. You don't have to come back in. And I think that's a powerful parallel of what we as believers are called to do. You and I were made to be in the life-saving business. We don't always see it because we're blinded by our unlimited busyness, but people in our world have little mini shipwrecks every single day. A friend that got chewed out by a boss, a couple that is fighting on the verge of separating, kids getting in trouble at school, someone getting caught in a lie, and mostly the lifelines that we have to throw to people are our words. And we have the opportunity to do one of two things, to either offer acceptance, love, and empathy, or the opportunity to blame, to cast judgment, and to belittle. And Paul, as he's writing to the church in Rome, said these three simple little words that we can quickly read over, but I want to stop today and just talk about these three words that the Apostle Paul tells us. He says to accept each other. Accept, what does, that, what does that mean to accept each other? That means to be for those around. Here's, here's a, a lengthier definition of acceptance. Acceptance means to believe that it is a very good thing that they are alive and long for what's best for them. And I'm not talking about people who agree with you, look like you are in your inner circle. The Bible says it's easy to love those who agree with you. I'm specifically talking about those who don't look like you, who may not agree with you, who may not have the same upbringing or experiences that you have. For us to accept them means to believe that it is a very good thing that they are alive and long for what's best for them. Doesn't mean to approve of everything they do. It means to continue to want what is best for them no matter what they do. And today we're gonna look at a story in John's gospel, John's account of Jesus's life found in chapter eight, verses one through 11. And in this account, we find three different parties. We find a woman who is caught in adultery we find a group of religious leaders who forgot they were supposed to be in the life-saving business. And the third party is Jesus, who takes even the worst shipwrecks and rescues people and restores them. Now this woman as a girl, I can imagine, she probably dreamed, just like, just like most little girls, she dreamed of, of white wedding dresses and children and a husband who loved her and baby showers and a family. But something went wrong in her marriage and we don't know what happened. Maybe she had some needs that weren't being met. Maybe she had a spouse who was distant. Maybe she brought this upon herself. But I know this, that no one grows up dreaming of being an adulterous wife or an adulterous husband. No one grows up dreaming that, oh, I can't wait. No, nobody does that. But it happened. And what started off as small and innocent grew into a full-blown affair. And I just want to side note here, the enemy never wants you to see the clarity of the first sin. He always wants to blur that line, just as he did with Adam and Eve, as he does with you and I today. It's not that big a deal, because once you cross that line, it gets easier to cross the next line. 
What started out as one small lie to her husband became a life and a sea of lies. The first lie was hard, but the 512th lie was easy. They got comfortable in their affair. They let their guard down. And then one day it happened. The doors fly open and she is drug out of bed and into the street. On one hand, she got here because of some potential unmet needs. But on another side, she made a thousand sequential decisions that brought her to this very moment. Like we talked about last week, the, the paralyzed man on the mat. Like the paralytic, she is then taken to Jesus, but she is not carried on a mat by friends. She is carried in sheets by her enemies. And she's not taken to Jesus for healing. She's taken to Jesus for execution. And these men who drag her to Jesus probably don't have much joy in life other than the little bit of delight they find in identifying other people's mats. What does it take to catch someone in adultery? <laughs> you basically have to be a stalker, right? You basically have to put yourself in some unflattering positions. You have to hope that they're gonna sin, not be heartbroken when they do. Those are two very different attitudes towards sin. And where is the guy in this scenario? Where is the adulterous man in this scenario? Why isn't he drug out as well? So you can tell this is a messed up situation. And the Bible tells us that really the motive of these religious leaders, these Pharisees, was not to catch the woman, but to trap Jesus. She is just an expendable pawn in their schemes. They know what the old covenant, the old law says, that if someone commits adultery, they should be stoned to death. And, and look, don't think little gravel like in your driveway. I had to steal this from my neighbor's garden. I did, I'm sorry, I'll put it back today. Big stones like deadly stones is what the law Says. And so they bring her to Jesus thinking, well, if Jesus lets her go, then he's obviously not, he's breaking the law. And if he condemns her, then the crowds who love him because he's so kind and sweet are gonna turn against him. But think for a second about what this woman is going through. Overwhelmed by, I mean, naked in public, wrapped in sheets, overwhelmed by shame, embarrassment, guilt, and fear. Wishing she could die afraid that she was about to. But the religious leaders could not care less of her emotions and feelings at the time. Blinded by their hate for Jesus and their contempt for her, they forgot that they were supposed to be in the life-saving business. They stand there with their stones in their hand, waiting for the chance to get to judge her. Have you ever held a stone in your hand? Some of us carry them, many of them ready to throw it. Whoever offends us or makes us uncomfortable in the slightest way. What's amazing about this scenario is there's actually more than one category of sin happening. There's two, sins of the flesh and sins of the spirit. Sins of the flesh are things like adultery, things like uh, lust or greed or gluttony or drunkenness or laziness or love of money. Th these are appetites that get out of control. Anything in our life that we crave more than God can become an idol. Even my kids can become an idol for me and get out of control. And as was the case with this woman, these sins can lead to other sins, deceit, betrayal, corruption, and adultery. But there's another category of sins going on in this scenario. Not sins of the flesh, but sins of the spirit. These are less about our bodies and more about our souls. We call them things like pride and arrogance and self-righteousness and hate and judgmental. They're under the radar. They're less spicy, less noticeable. And you never hear stories of people's careers ending because of sins of the spirit. We often only hear them about sins of the flesh, corruption or theft or sexual misconduct. 
And when people committed sins of the flesh and they got near Jesus, they knew that they were sinners. But when people committed sins of the spirit and they got near Jesus, they felt superior. They felt better than everyone else. They thought they could love God and despise people at the same time. They didn't know that their sins of the spirit were more destructive than sins of the flesh. See, here's a reality we gotta know. We are most scandalized by sins of the flesh. That's what you're gonna see as you check out at the grocery store, sins of the flesh on the tabloids. But Jesus was most scandalized by sins of the spirit. Think about that for a second. What offends you the most? What are you most scandalized by? What are you aware of in your own self? Here's how C.S. Lewis says it. The sins of the flesh are bad, but they are the least bad of all sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing, the pleasures of power and hatred. For there are two things inside of every single one of us. They are the animal self, the sins of the flesh, and the diabolical self, the sins of the spirit. The diabolical self is the worst of the two. That is why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. I wonder if these cold, heartless Pharisees, when they first went into the ministry, were this way. Or were their hearts warm? Were their hearts caring? Were their hearts empathetic, truly wanting to serve God? Over time, something obviously happened. Their knowledge created a callous. Their knowledge created an arrogance and a superiority. And the worst thing about spiritual pride is this, is that we're blind to it. We're blind, we're we're unaware, we are oblivious to it. At least the sins of the flesh, like it's hard to deny. But the sins of the spirit, you just walk through life with stones in your hand, judgmental thoughts, superior attitudes, impatient words, bitter resentment, little room for love, people around you trembling in brokenness and guilt, and all we have to offer them are stones. We don't even notice them because we forgot that we were supposed to be in the life-saving business. And what's so amazing about this is that churches can be some of the greatest producers of stone throwers. How is that possible? Under a banner of a king and a savior who laid down his life and offered us renewal, not through earning it, but through grace and faith. How then is it possible that we turn around in our arrogance and we throw stones at people? I've been there before. I've been that guy who said, look at how good of a Christian I am. I got my stuff together. What's wrong with you fools? Why can't you be more like me instead of saying, man, let's all be more like Jesus. This is what Jesus was most opposed to. Heard a story of a Christian who uh, came across, uh, cross paths with a prostitute and he asked her how she was doing and she opened up. And she was not only into some dark stuff, she was in some even worse stuff than prostitution. And he he said, well, ma'am, why why haven't you gone to the church? Why why haven't you gone there? And this is what he said to her. Why would I ever go there? I'm already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. Ouch. Ouch. That hurts. Why is it that in ancient times, women like this ran towards Jesus, but in our day, they so often run away from his followers? What might a church look like if they refused to pick up stones to throw? That's why our founding pastor for over 35 years has been telling us, reminding us that we are not a perfect church. We are a church filled with exes, ex-liars, ex-drunks, ex-adulterers, ex-addicts, ex-Pharisees. 
We are a church filled with exes. We are not a showcase for saints. We are a hospital for sinners. We all walk with a limp. We all have scars because of our, si- of our sin. We all are not normal. Here's how we say it best and most succinctly at the Bayou. That everyone has a story. Every single one of us has a story, a unique path that God is calling us towards, that he is writing. And we all come in with baggage and dysfunction and brokenness. And we all need a savior. That's why it doesn't matter what you look like, what you talk like. This church is for you because everyone here has a story. So there laid this woman ready to die, her executioners with stones in their hands, asking Jesus to render his judgment, to let her go or to stone her. And then Jesus does the most peculiar thing. He bends down and starts doodling in the dust. He starts writing in the dirt and in the dust. It almost seems like Jesus doesn't care about the gravity of the situation. So he writes and we don't know what he wrote. And he stands up and he says, go ahead and stone her. Go ahead, do it. But one thing before you begin, let the person who has no sin be the first one to throw a stone at this woman. And he kneels back down and he starts writing some more. And again, we don't know what he wrote. I've heard some good theories about what he wrote. We can only guess. Here, here's, here's one theory, is that maybe Jesus knelt down and started writing the names of the mistresses of the Pharisees going, oh, so you're opposed to adultery, huh? Whatever he's writing, he's putting the stone throwers in a clear position Go ahead and stone her. Go ahead, put her to death. Condemn her. But just remember this, that sinful people are in no place to throw stones. That sinful people like me, like you, are in no place to throw our stones at other people. When unique people, not normal people, start throwing stones, we end up passing judgment on ourselves. And then Jesus kneels down again and starts writing in the dust yet again. And then something amazing happens. In the moment of tension so thick that you could cut it with a knife, they hear this. And the first person whose arm was cocked back, ready to kill, drops his stone. And starting from the oldest to the youngest, they one by one leave and walk away. See, this is what we gather from this story, that there is no room in Jesus's community for stone throwers. We are all too broken, all too not normal, too unique. And Philip Yancey says this, Jesus's audience would have divided people into two categories. Sinners like the woman and the righteous like the men. Yet Jesus in one brilliant stroke replaces them with two different categories. Sinners who admit and sinners who deny. Jesus flips the script on them. And so let me ask you this question. Do you have any stones that you need to let go of? Do you have any bitterness, judgmentalism, arrogance, hate, or pride? Any sins of the spirit in your heart? I've seen them oftentimes in mine. And I honestly feel them creep up a lot too. And I've got to say, no, that is not who Jesus has called me to be. Maybe you've got a spouse that you're angry with who may on the surface, it seems like they're just trying to destroy your life. But maybe underneath the surface, there's something else going on. Maybe there's a pain, an unmet need, a heartache, a history of abuse in their past. Maybe instead of a a stone thrown at them, 
They need a word of love, a, a word of forgiveness, a word of encouragement. Maybe they need a hug. Maybe they just need your silent presence. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a, a wayward child. Maybe it's an ex-spouse. The marriage has been done, it's legally done, but they're still fighting. And the, thr- the stone needs to be dropped. You've carried that stone for so long that you don't even re- realize that you're still carrying it. What if you dropped it and you accepted them? I heard a story of a family who they, they had a brilliant idea for a way that they were gonna honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. They got kids at home and they said, on Sunday for Sabbath, there will be no criticism in this house. No, no critiquing at all whatsoever on Sundays. And they reported that something funny happened. All of their children's friends always came over on Sunday. Because who amongst us doesn't wanna be in a community where stones are dropped instead of thrown? See, this is the reason why Jesus was such a magnet, such a draw for people. He is the only sinless person who ever lived, the only one who was truly justified in his judgments. But instead, he doesn't just tolerate us, he loves us, he embraces us, he welcomes us in our messiness and in our brokenness with open arms. What's funny is that people don't run to Christians too often because we've trained them that when they're in trouble, what they're gonna get from Christians is judgment and condemnation and and stories about how I would have done it differently. But what if we didn't do that? What if we truly listened to people and where they were and what was going on in their hearts and in their minds? What if as Christians, we became known not what we're against, but what we are for, that we love people. You don't even have to agree with us, but we love people just like Jesus did. And that's exactly what this woman found in Jesus, completely out in public with all of her sins. And now that the stone throwers are gone, it is just Jesus and this woman. And with all the, the ability in the world for Jesus to judge and condemn her, he asked her this. Just imagine him kneeling down next to her, almost whispering these words. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Jesus isn't asking for their location. He's asking, do you realize what just shifted here? They brought you to me as if they were normal and you were not. But now everyone sees that they're all broken and they all are in need of someone to save them. And Jesus, she replies to Jesus, no, Lord, neither do I, says Jesus. I'm, though I'm able to, not going to throw a stone at you. You'll get no condemnation from me. I love you even when you're in sin. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus says some words that cut to her heart and bring her back to life. They fill her with pain because they reveal that he knows what she's been doing. But they also fill her with, fill her with hope because they tell her that someone believes in her. These words will remain with her until she is old and gray and surrounded by grandchildren. Jesus says this, go, and sin no more. Go and sin no, the the perfect blend of truth and of love. Go and sin no more. Now remember, acceptance isn't the same thing as condoning. Jesus acknowledges here what is right and what is wrong but he also communicates his love and acceptance for her. Accepting someone doesn't mean you never speak up. Sometimes you need to confront. Sometimes you need to address something that cannot go on. Paul says it this way. This is so important. Speak, speak, but speak the truth 
in love. Speak the truth in love. In love is the most important part. Speak the truth, not in superiority or arrogance or judgment, but in love, in a desire for their well-being. Sometimes it may feel like to not speak is love, but sometimes it's hate. And sometimes it may feel like speaking may feel like hate, but actually speaking the truth in love is actually love. To accept someone is to want what is best for them, to think that it is a very good thing that they are alive. And if you don't have love when you're ready to speak, then be quiet. Speak the truth in love. See, a funny thing happens when you grow more like Jesus. <laughs> in one hand, you grow less judgmental of other people, but at the same time, you grow more aware of what is wrong and what is right. Check this out. Making judgments and being judgmental are two very different things. We can determine something is wrong without attacking a person's worth and value. This is exactly what Jesus did with this woman. He identified her sin, but at the same time, he accepted her and communicated her value. And amazingly, radical acceptance and forgiveness does what condemnation and judgmentalism cannot, as it did for her, and as it does for us, produces a changed heart. Because when all I have is the law, that I'm a filthy sinner, and that's it, it's not gonna change my heart, that's just gonna confirm my despair. But when I am aware of the law, that I'm a filthy sinner. And then I learn of the new covenant, the new Testament, that Jesus went to the cross to pay for all of my filthy sin and then offers me restoration, redemption, renewal, not through works, but through turning from my old way of living and following him and believing in him, then that's when my heart starts to beat anew again. This is exactly what Jesus did for this woman. What if we did this for others as well? After all, as Christians, we are in the life-saving business. And remember, you have to go out you don't have to come back in. So who am I talking to today? There are a couple ways I see this landing for you. First category is for people who would maybe say, man, I, I, I feel unworthy. I, I'm not able to go to Jesus. I got too much sin on my hands. He has made a way where there, uh, there was no way. Even in your sin, Jesus loves you, paid for your sin. Your bill has been paid. If you would turn and believe. That's the gospel. Is that you today? Do you need to, as this woman did, receive forgiveness? I know it feels uncomfortable. Like, well, how can I just receive it? It seems like too much. I know it is. It does feel that way. But Jesus has done this for you. He's given you the greatest gift you could ever receive in your life. Paid for forgiveness and reconciliation with your heavenly father. Oh man, he's, the, he's that good. And he's got a whole bunch of other good things planned for you. So that's the first group I wanna to speak to today. The second group is maybe, maybe you're a believer and you have like the Pharisees felt your heart become callous and you've caught yourself judging, condemning, hating. Would you allow Jesus to soften your heart? Would you choose today to drop those stones and instead to love those around you? Here's what I do when I'm feeling spiritually arrogant and prideful. 
I stop and I take an account of all that Jesus has forgiven me of. <laughs> Doesn't take long to realize apart from Christ, I have nothing good to offer. But because of Christ, all that's been washed away by the blood of Jesus. So then how can I go and judge other people? See, when you remember the gospel, the gospel is not just for brand new believers. The gospel is for us every single day because we remind ourselves that we've been forgiven. And that is what fuels and motivates how we treat those around us. If Jesus didn't throw a stone at me, how can I throw a stone at other people? I can't, I can't. I need to offer them what he offered me, what we talked about in week one, shalom, his peace and his love. And the third place that I see this landing is really for everyone watching. God's answer to our brokenness is first off Jesus, but you know how we experience him? In community, in commu doing life with other people. So again, I wanna, I wanna challenge you. Would you trust me? Would you trust God's leading? And would you go to thebayouchurch.org slash groups and find a small group that works for you? Because I promise you, God's gonna grow you, bless you, challenge you, and bring so many beneficial things into your life. Let me pray for you real quick and then Griff's gonna close us out. Father, thank you for this unbelievable moment, Lord, where you had every right to throw a stone. But instead, Lord, you wrapped your arms around this woman just like you do with us today. And you offer us forgiveness and love, grace and mercy, Lord. Father, for those today who feel unworthy, who feel like they've done too much to ever be forgiven, Lord, I pray that you would break those chains today and invite them into a relationship with you. And if that's you, just, just pray this simple prayer. God, I admit that I've sinned. I wanna turn from my sin and follow you. I believe in your son, Jesus. Pray that right now. God, I admit my sin and I believe in your son, Jesus. Help me to follow him. The Bible says when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, that we are saved. That's where we get that word from. That we are saved from our own lives, trying to drive our own car off the cliff. And instead Jesus rescues us and secures us, gives us his Holy Spirit. And if that's you today and you prayed that prayer, congratulations, let us know. Go to the bayouchurch.org slash online, click that connect button and let us know. God, for those like myself who have been struggling with sins of the spirit, would you humble us, Lord? Remind us of what you did for us and motivate us to go do it for others, Lord. And would you help all of us to find a small group this week, today? And would you bless us as you promise you will when we find community, Lord? God, we love you. You are so good. It is hard to keep up with all the ways that you bless us, Lord. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church.